interview with Mr. and Mrs. Elmer Meyer for the Valley Historical Preservation Project. The interview is myself, Margaret Foxwell, assisted by my husband, Tom. Uh, in attendance are the Meyers. And this, the date is March 19th. We are in our home here in Elgin, Iowa. Once thank you for granting this interview. The material material will be used to interpret the heritage of our region and will be primarily used for in educational purposes and may also be used in promoting economic development and tourism. Elmer, the first basic question is, what is your full name? Elmer Lewis Meyer. Where were you, when were you born? November 30th, 1916. Where? Wadena, Iowa. Where were your parents born? My parents were born in Marion Township, Clayton County, Iowa. Did you have any family members who immigrated to the U.S.? On my dad's side, Christian and Rosina Schlup Meyer came from Switzerland. On mother's side, my great-grandparents, Nicholas and Elizabeth Junker Baumgartner, also came from Switzerland. Your education, why did you go to school? I went 12 years here in Elgin, graduated from high school in 1934, and I had one semester at Upper Iowa in Fayette. Did you ever go to a real school? Nope. No. You graduated from Upper Iowa then? No, no. I went one semester. One, one semester. Yeah. Then what did you do? Well, I had to have an operation, and then I kind of ran out of money, so I started working on the farm. Well, what's the farm? Just south of Elgin, about a half a mile from Martin Wingers. Martin Wingers. Mm -hmm. Were you married then? No. I was still in, just a year out of high school. You were working on a farm then? Mm-hmm. Well, now let's uh, hear about you, says the spouses. Your maiden name? Verna Gross. When were you born? Uh, December 6, 1924. When? We, when? Uh, where? Where. I was born uh, right close to Elgin here on the farm where um, Jeff Klein and Leanne Klein live now. That was a family home? No, that, that belonged to uh, Joe B. Snyder. I see. Your parents were living there? Yes. Uh -huh. Did you have family immigrate? Yes, my grandmother, uh, mother's mother, came from Numedal, Norway. And, uh, let's see, my father's uh, parents came from Norway also, from uh, Hollingdahl, and my mother's father, uh, grandfather, came from Valders, Norway. All from Norway? Mm-hmm. What about your education? Where was it? Well, I started school here in Elgin, about halfway through the fourth grade when we moved to Decorah, and then I went to a country school. I graduated from there in the eighth grade, and um, after that, we, I had one year at Decorah High School and came back to the Elgin area, and so I went to school here in Elgin again for the last three years of high school. And after that, I was home for a while, then went into uh, nurses training in, in, in um, Chicago at the Lutheran Deaconess School of Nursing. How long was that? Three years. Three years. You mentioned uh, country school. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. Did you have to, you said you were eighth grade there. Mm -hmm. Did you have to take those eighth grade tests? Oh, yes. Where did you take them? At Decora. In the Decora School? Uh, no, at the courthouse. At the courthouse? We've heard different stories. Some took them in the school, some took them, I took mine in the West Union school in mm -hmm. the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Did you like them? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. They were difficult, but uh, That's right. uh, 
I, I have a capital I to show that I took them. After you folks were <coughs> finished your schooling, what did you do? Uh, after I finished nurses training? Yes. Well, I continued working in, the, in Chicago at the school where I trained until um, the later part of March 1950 was when I came home and that's when we were married in 23rd of April 1950. 23rd of April 1950. Uh, then what? Elmer, what did you do then? Me? Yes. Well, let's see, by then I was in the post office. Right. Were you in service when she was working in yes. Chicago? I was in service from 1941 to 1945. Where did you serve and what in? I was in the Army and I was in European theater, World War II. You serve overseas? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, the most famous battle that he was in was the Battle of the Bulge. Oh. I've heard about this afterward because Elmer and I did not know each other at that time. Where did you meet? Here at home. <laughs> That's the story too. Uh, at that time I was working in the post office and Hank was postmaster. And uh, he was going with Verna's sister. So he had a date with her and he just said to me, do you want to go along tonight? We're going over to Garna Villa to the restaurant. I didn't have anything else to do, so I said, okay. And Verna happened to be home from Chicago, and Argus <laughs> said to her, I've got a date tonight. Do you want to go <laughs> along? And she said, I guess so. So that's how we met. And how long was the courtship? <laughs> uh, oh, dear. Let's see. That must have been uh, a, year so, a, a year and a half, I, th I think, because uh, this was in the summertime. Where were you married then? At East Claremont Church. Was that uh, the family home church of one of you? For me. Yours. Mm -hmm. And it? That was. Uh, there's, there was a, a division as far as the families were concerned. There was one group that went to the Haugi Lutheran Church and my grandparents were there, went there. And then this other group that was north of our place went to the East Claremont Church. Later years, they combined, but at that time, they were, um, not when I was there, but I mean, uh, in the beginning, why they were two separate churches. Where was that church? Where was it? The the ones that were in the Haugi Synod met in their homes. They did. Mm -hmm. And the other one, the church was there. Mm -hmm. uh, after you were married then, where did you folks live, Alma? We lived uh, first just south of town here on Mark Winger's farm from where uh, Harry, Harry and Marnus Klein live now, only in the old house. That was before the new house was built. Are you farmed then, or were you in no, the post office? No, I was office? in the post office. You were in the post office. While, I, while we were on uh, our honeymoon, I got a transfer from clerk to rural carrier. So I was a rural carrier then when I came back. Were you working then, Verna? No. No, I, at home. The work outside of the home that I did at that time was individuals that were terminal cases and they wanted to stay in their home and so I would I did go and, and help take care of them mainly giving them uh, the medication so that they could remain at home. She worked later though at, at West, West Union Hospital yeah. and Postville Nursing Home and School Nurse. And school nurse. School. Uh -huh. um, Elmer, just what were your duties when you worked in the post office? 
as clerk or as yes. railroad carrier? Clerk. Well, as clerk was sorted mail, put it in the individual boxes, sold stamps, money orders, insurance for packages, um, canceled the letter stamps, tied it out to send out, and uh, we sent out an awful lot of cappers' chicks. A lot of times we had to work on Sunday to get those out. And uh, the mail at that time came in either three or four times a day. It came by train part of the time in rural and star out also. Could you elaborate, elaborate a little on the cappers' chick hatchery shippings? Uh, Capper's chicks were sent out in cardboard boxes with little round air holes in them, and the <laughs> box was divided into four sections so the chicks wouldn't uh, pile up and smother them each other. And uh, you come in the post office, it sounds like a hatchery because they were peeping. Smells like it too. It smells like it, right. And there's a story about one farmer, he said, I don't want Capper's chicks, I want mine from Henry Field. So he sent to Henry Fields for his chicks, and when they came back, they, they were in the same box that they left the Elgin Post Office in. How did they? They, they had made a trip to Yankton, South Dakota, and come back again. Henry Field bought how many like Capper's chicks? How many live chicks were left? Uh, I think there were a few dead ones. Did uh, how long did they stay in those boxes when they were sh shipped out? Well, uh, they shipped they, all over the country. They weren't in the office very long. No. Not over oh two or three hours at the most. And Paul Larson had a. A truck that he uh, trucked them to Postville quite often, because there'd be more than the mail truck could handle, and he hauled them up there to the train. When they sent them out, though, mm -hmm. they were they on went the, all over the United States. Wonder how long it would take them. I suppose two or three days, some of them. Poor things. Uh, did you? Did they ever send out hatching eggs? I don't think so. Don't think so. Not through the post office. Mm -hmm. Well, that was your clerking. Mm -hmm. Can we hear some of your experiences as a rural carrier? Well, when I started, I had about 50, 52 miles. It was in 1950. Most of the roads were still dirt. I had a few gravel. I don't know if there was any paved road or not, but I bought a new Jeep, a 1950 Jeep, Willis Jeep. I had a 46 Plymouth that I had bought when I came home from the service. And uh, we went to work between 6 and 7 in the morning. The mail came in a lot earlier than it does now. It seems like uh, progress has kind of gone backwards as far as mail coming in to town. We lost our trains. We sorted the mail, each box, each farm, well, some in town too had a pigeonhole and we sorted all the mail and then strapped it out starting with the last one first. Usually I had six or seven bundles. We had an awful lot of packages and every year we got, twice a year we got Sears Roebuck, Montgomery Ward and, and Spiegel's catalogs pennies. and pennies and I think every home probably got one or two. Uh, we also sold stamps, money orders, and everything that was available at the post office. Had a lot of mud roads. A lot of times I had four chains on the Jeep. I even got stuck up on 56, which was a state highway. Had to have Bert Benson pull us out with a team of horses. And we carried a scoop shovel all the time in the winter time. Uh, shovel a lot of snow. A lot of times we detour, come in from a different road, or walk a little ways to serve somebody's box. But there were very few days that we didn't get part of the mail out. 
and uh, I still have the Jeep that I started with in 1950. It still runs. Right now it needs a little work on the carburetor, but it's still handy on the farm. I had 25 years of hauling mail and met a lot of nice people. Got a lot of nice Christmas presents at Christmas time. I don't know if They anything. also depended on you sometimes to bring something from the grocery store. Yeah, but it wasn't legal, but some <laughs> people called in and said, would you bring such and such from the store? Then I had a few passengers, which wasn't uh, supposed to be either. We were at a meeting once, and the inspector was talking, and he was telling us not to pick up passengers and, unless they're hurt or something like that. One fellow says, well, what if a good-looking blonde wants a ride? He said, tell her to sprain her ankle and get in. <laughs> <laughs> they overlooked a few things. Did you ever have trouble in the snow? Oh yes, I got stuck quite a few times, but I always got home. A lot of times I'd have to detour quite a ways, or shovel. I shoveled halfway up to Pete Ingen Hill one time, that's down by Highland. That's about, oh, I don't know, a quarter of a mile long, I guess. Finally ended up putting on the chains anyway. When uh, the bad snowstorms came, did you just the mail didn't come in, so you didn't go out, Well, if right? it didn't come in, then we didn't go out. But if it came in, we went. Went as far as we could. Then I used to go through Gunder when at the first part of my route, or at first, and uh, Harvey Anderson had a service station out there. So if I had a flat tire on the way, then I'd stop there and get my tires fixed and fill up on gas, and he always had a pot of coffee on. And I usually eat my dinner in Gunder. A lot of times went to Benson's store and bought a sack of uh, corn curls, potato chips, or something like that. But most of the time I carried my dinner. Vernon would pack me something. You ate on the way then? Right. I always stopped for about a half hour. Interesting. And all the time you were doing home health care as they wanted. Mm -hmm. It was a home health care of today with it's a different a bit, name. But I think it's quite a bit different. <laughs> oh, I think it must be. Medicare isn't paying the bill for one no. thing. No. No, the uh, American Cancer Society allowed one dollar uh, for a person to go and give some medication. Oh. Did they have to be terminal cases? Yes. They did. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was great. There was little help. Um, what about your school day memories? Verna, do you remember some that you would like to share and laugh with us over? Um, well, uh, Start with your the, childhood memories. Yeah, the first thing um, that comes to mind is that when Arnis and I were little, we spoke nothing but Norwegian. So it comes time, it came time to go to school. We didn't know any English. So my mother, who was a teacher, gave us a crash course in English. <laughs> and the, uh, but even with that, when we saw each other on the playground or anything, we would always run to each other and we would be talking Norwegian. No matter what the teachers did, we, it, if we had a chance, we were talking Norwegian. Your sisters? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, And where that, were you in school? Here in Elgin. Okay. None of the teachers spoke Norwegian. Oh. And so, of course, that was so. Uh, that was a uh, part of it that they didn't like because they thought we were. They didn't know what we were saying, you know. And up by Decora, we were along the highway, uh, number nine. 
so it was much easier getting to school. And we walked. We had a mile to school. And uh, there we would play Andy I over. Um, Blind Man's Bluff and uh, all kinds of that type of games, you know. Once in a while, um, in the spring especially, the, there was a couple of boys that, that drove or drove, rode their horses. And so then we were all taking turns riding horses and during the recess. Um, there was no insurance liability of concern then, was there? No. No. That was, of course, my dad didn't know it. <laughs> he didn't know that we were riding horses. But we never, we never uh, got hurt either. So, and we had, I had a, a, a friend, little boy, that was, he was just a very good singer. He was, uh, uh, he was unable to walk very well. And he couldn't stand for any length of time. He was, had been injured as a baby. But he could sing. And we just, every, every uh, program we ever had, he was singing. And uh, that's one thing that uh, I think the young people miss a lot now is that they don't have the programs that we used to have. We would have, you know, in the fall we would have something for Thanksgiving or even Halloween and um, for Christmas there was a program and at Easter time and at also uh, Valentine's not necessarily for the whole community, but always for, for the kids, you know. And then at the end of school, the, the uh, last day of school, there was always a program that the parents could come. Are you speaking of a real school? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a very good teacher. She was, she um, got everything worked in and we had our our studies and classes and everything too. So we, um, she used to stay at our house and uh, there was a certain program on radio that we both liked to listen to. And of course, when the folks were not in the house, then we were not, we were not to have the radio on. But it was all right because um, Miss Miss uh, Ruin was there, and so we we did get to listen to this one program <laughs> when she was around, and we went ice skating with her, and just she was just a real nice person. Elmer, do you have some childhood memories, school memories that you'd like to share? Well, <clears throat> I think he has. I had a long ways to walk. I had four blocks to walk from home <laughs> to school. The first uh, ten, no, yeah, first ten years. We lived up north end of Franklin Street, no, west end, where Betty Halverson lives now. So I could go home for dinner. The last two years I walked. I lived with Martin Louis out south of town here. I walked across the field. I carried my dinner then. Uh, the funniest thing I remember was a little girl out in the yard. That was in the days of black bloomers. The elastic had broken her bloomers and they were down around her ankles and she was <laughs> out in the schoolyard just to cry her head off till the teacher came with a safety pin. <laughs> she was hobbled. <laughs> There was one thing I forgot, was that uh, every day, this was in Elgin here, and uh, it was my first year of school, and the uh, teacher would read to us at the end of the day, the last half hour, and 
we were all gathered around her, of course. And there were a couple of us that just couldn't sit still that one day. It was absolutely impossible. And she scolded us and she warned us. And then finally she sent us to our desk. We had to sit there. And she said, and you're also going to stay after school for a half an hour. Well, that was punishment. And, and especially since the reason we couldn't sit still was that there was a little boy behind <coughs> us with a pin and he was sticking the pin into us. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I'm glad you told that story. Elmer, were you in, in uh, school sports? Yes, I played basketball and baseball. I wasn't big enough to play football. Uh, I played all four years in the other two sports. He's a quickie boy in basketball. Why did you play your um, baseball games? Was, where did we play our baseball yes. games? It wasn't much schoolyard. Um, let's see, it's where Roger Faub's house is about now. It was in Shorey's pasture. And uh, Rose had to shut the gate so the cattle wouldn't get out. Or I used to clean up the droppings <laughs> of the cattle yeah. before the gate. Uh, I played third base most of the time. And there used to be an amphitheater there for the people to sit in. Oh. Did you have uniforms? Mm hmm. Yeah, we were right up there. Uptown <laughs> stuff. Yep. Did you remember any teachers? Sure, I remember. I think probably all my teachers. Well, let's hear them. Okay, the first one I had was Miss Dugan, and then Miss Nano, the second grade, <coughs> and no, no. both of our sons had her as a kindergarten teacher. Same teacher. Uh, and that's, yeah, she was Mrs. Keipel when they had her. Then I had Marie Mosby and uh, Verna Yunker, Hazel Frieden in seventh and eighth grade. In high school I had L.B. Carter, who was the superintendent and the manual training teacher. Charles Whitney, algebra, geometry, and sports. One coach had all three sports. We didn't have a coach for each separate sport. And Rudy Jorgensen for English, Miss Crow for history, Miss uh, Hoyt, Miss Hoyt for shorthand typing and bookkeeping. Gil Molson was what physical training. Yeah, had uh, had uh, Shorey. Georgie Mae Shorey, too, when I was in the lower grades. What'd she teach? Physical training. Oh, I understand that. What about Miss Crow? I hear all kinds of stories she about was, her. She was the most respected teacher in the state, I, I think. <laughs> what she said went. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't want to learn, you learned anyway, right? Right. I still know the presidents, up until the <laughs> present ones. Present ones. And I can name all the states, too, just because she drilled things like that into us. Penny. I guess you wanted to learn, eh? Was the school quite modern by today's standards? You had well, good equipment? The, I would say it was very modern. I'm sorry that it's not here anymore. Not for school, but for, for history. Uh, should, do you want me to de describe the school building? If you'd like. Okay, it was a three-story brick building, and in the back there was an addition built on, I think it was finished in 1924. That included the gymnasium on the basement floor, and above was the assembly hall and two classrooms. Then the main part, which was built much earlier, that was also three, that was a three-story building. In the basement was the boiler room and the manual training room. The girls' restroom and locker room and on the other side the boys' restroom and locker room. And then 
in the back of the gymnasium was a, a storage room and also the boys, that was the boys' locker room. And the first floor, right inside the door to the left were two classes, to the right were two classes, and back at the end of the hall were two classes. Upstairs, to the left of the stairway was the seventh and eighth grade. To the right was the economics room, and back a ways was the superintendent's office. And straight ahead from the stairway was Chuck Whitney's his al algebra and geometry. And then around his room and, and down the hall was the uh, assembly room and the other two classrooms. It's a good memory. And uh, when we were dismissed at five minutes to four, Miss Crow had a little bell and it was ding, turn, ding, rise, ding, march. <laughs> and you marched. And we marched, orderly. <laughs> can you add anything to that, Verna? I can add a little change to it. When I was in school, that uh, one room uh, that you were saying, the um, math teacher was in. That was a science room when I was there. And when my boys were there, it was the fifth grade room. So it, it changed through the years. And then later they moved on country schools. Yes. Mm -hmm. For music. Mm -hmm. And Alan went to sixth grade there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do it. Um, can you tell us about the, anything about the opera house? Okay. Uh, upstairs was a big room. It had balconies on three sides. And to the front, as you entered, you came in up the stairway, and there were two doors there. You could go into the main room from either side or upstairs to the balconies. There was a stage at the far end. They had a lot of they called them Chautauquas then, I guess. I think that's how you pronounce it. And they were real interesting. It's usually home talent. I remember the womanless wedding at one time. That was all men, and they played the parts of everything. And uh, Al Shorey was a little baby. He was a bald-headed old man, but he still got in the baby carriage and had a baby bottle. Uh, they all usually had dances on Saturday night, and uh, when they did the shotish, the floor kind of went up and down, but it never went through. Then we had uh, silent pictures. The screen was up front. Florence Klingman played the piano through the whole film because there was no sound. We had to read what everybody said. And uh, I think <coughs> later on we got uh, sound pictures, and the first one I ever saw was the Marx Brothers. Down in the basement was what they called the pool hall. They had pool tables and card tables and a lunch counter, and, and uh, when it was allowed, a beer counter, I guess. Popcorn, peanuts, salted peanuts, and lots of smoke. <laughs> What was Saturday night like in town? Saturday night was the busiest night in town. Every store was open. The barber shops were full. Farmers brought their eggs to town and they bought their groceries. And uh, had band concerts in the park. Lots of people on the streets visiting. And, and uh, and I usually bought a pint of ice cream and a sack of peanuts. You eat it park. on the sidewalk? I went over in the park and sat on the bench and ate it with a bunch of other guys. Bruno, were you in the picture then? No. Not at all. <laughs> Can you tell us about some of the stores?
Can you tell us about some of the stores? I don't really remember don't. too much about Elgin. Mm -hmm. um, the Saturday nights I remember are the ones we had at Decora, okay. which isn't for this territory. And uh, when we came back, um, the Saturday nights had changed. Uh, they weren't they weren't as busy on no. Saturday night as they had been before and uh, and the young folk had their cars and when we had a date we would go to Decora to the movies or um, They do now. They go to Prairie du Chien. We didn't do that, but that's um, that was one of the changes. Elma, can you describe Tommy's store? That's where our historical society is now. Oh, let's see. Was it always a, a grocery store? It was a general store. General I would call store. it. Uh, I think what? That's where your weather be is. Yeah. <laughs> Peter Weatherbird? Yeah. It seems like on the right hand side they had the cloth thread. On the left hand side were the groceries. And in the back they had shoes and boots. And uh, Thomas sold Peter Weatherbird shoes. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Robert Wadlow, but he was the tallest man in the world, over eight feet tall. And Max had him come to Elgin one time through the shoe company. And I was just a little squirt at that time. Of course, I had to have my nose up to the front. When Robert got out of the car, it was a, uh, about a 30, 31 Chevy, I think. It was a two-door. They had taken the front jumper seat out. And he got in there and sat in the back seat, so his legs came clear up to the front. When he got out of the car, I was right close. He pretty near stepped on me. <laughs> I never heard why he came. We have pictures of him down to the historical building. He was advertising for Peter Weatherbird shoes. It's interesting. Was that always a, a dry goods store in that? As far building? as I know, yeah. <laughs> what uh, do you know about some of the other stores then? Did they have cafes? Uh, the first cafe I remember is uh, Cliff and Arley, I think, but they had some before. Oh, Evans Cafe was before that. Mm -hmm. That uh, it was down there where the lower tavern is now. Remember Marie and Harry Heston? Yeah. Yeah, wasn't that in where the clothing store? Where the Echo Office. Echo Office. Way up there? Yeah. Okay. The store I'm most acquainted with was Adam Bolin because he was just across the railroad track from us. And I always had to go over there and get a ring of bologna and loaf of bread. Fifteen cents and a nickel. That was up in up Upper Town. Upper yeah. Town. And that was just a grocery store? That was a general store, general too. General store, too. And where yeah. was that? That was right Where's across from the lumber yard. Where, oh. Yeah, Harold Halverson had his store. That's where yeah. Halverson's store was yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Luna, I've always wondered, um, in my time being in the community, there was no Lutheran church in Elgin, was there? No. Where did the people go, the Lutherans? Uh, I know some to came the, to Elyria. Yes. Some went to Highland. Um, quite a few of them down to Highland because that's where their relation was with the Bensons and the Torkelsons. And then uh, uh, some went to East Claremont, that's where my folks went, and West Claremont, and I uh, don't know if they went any further than that, usually not because uh, of the distance, and, but then they, they uh, or Reverend Nesset in uh, 
East and West Claremont and Highland parishes. He was he was having to do too much work. He wasn't able to get around to seeing all the people, and so he was he was trying to get another church started in the Elgin area, and he was finally successful. Um, Do you know when, when it was built? It was, uh, the first service was Christmas 1953, and uh, that's, how close are we to an anniversary again now? That's, Highland is working on an anniversary year. Yeah. That'll be their hundredth. Mm -hmm. What other churches were here in uh, your young memory? The Methodist Church right up the street here and the Baptist Church. That's the only two that so were in Elgin. There were mm -hmm. earlier churches mm -hmm. elsewhere in town, I expect. Yeah. Apostolic was out in the country at that time. It was where? Well, we're kind of down the Dutch bottom, five miles east, east of Elgin, southeast. Mm -hmm. Down on Agate Road now, I guess. I wonder when that church was built up where it is now. Gee, I don't know the year now. Did they move it up? Mm -hmm. Something up there? Part of it. Mm -hmm. They didn't move the whole thing. So just to be a Yeah. Oh, do you have some important people you remember in nope. town? No. I uh, thought I should skip that. Who was the school superintendent when you went to L.B. Carter. Were you in town in school at the same time? He was a year ahead of me. And you've talked about the, did you, entertainment? That was what you had described for Saturday night. Were there any ethnic con traditions that were common here? Well, the only ethnic things that I can think of is we talked Swiss at home, and a lot of the kids couldn't talk English when they started school. And I think all the, most of the Swiss families turned water into wine. Of course, they had to add a little fruit and a little sugar and give it quite a <laughs> bit of time. <laughs> but most of them had a wine barrel in the base. But it was used mainly for company and for Sundays or something like that. Reuben Lehman told about picking the wild berries and things yeah. for people and getting paid to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. what that was your ethnic tradition. And we had uh, certain, certain foods that uh, Swiss cornbread, we still make that, and knee patches. That's a thing we make for Christmas. They were called knee patches because the women would roll out the dough and then stretch it over their knee. But they put a towel over, <laughs> a, a kitchen towel over their knee first. and. Uh, Stribli, which is uh, about the same thing as funnel cakes. Now that was Swiss. Mm -hmm. Venice would have been Norwegian. Norwegian. They think. have lefse and flatbread and rummergrot and uh, what else? Ludafisk. I've been married to a Norwegian for 40 some years and haven't tasted Ludafisk yet. But she doesn't like it, so why should I try it? You don't know whether you like it or not. Right. Lefts is very good. You don't want to go flatbread. You don't want to go into your your uh, youth, do you? Whatever. Yeah, I can do that. First, I better do a little explaining. Uh, my parents and my dad's brother and my mother's sister farmed together over by Wadena. They lived in the same house. And uh, by 1919, my parents had four children, and John and Ida had one child and one on the way. And that was at the time of the flu epidemic. And both of my parents and John died 
my mother, my father died February 1st, 1919, and mother February the 2nd, and then John a few days later. So that took three of the adults out of that household, and that kind of split up our family. I, to the remaining living adult, took Hilda and Melbert from my family and her son Harold and moved back to her parents or my grandparents, Adolf and Marianne Baumgartner. And my youngest sister, Eva, who was two months old, was taken to live with our Aunt Rose Meyer, who married Jay Frieden, so that'd be a sister of my dad. And she lived with them. And then I went into the family of Celia Meyer, who was also a Baumgartner. She was my sister's, my mother's sister. And she was married to a Meyer, but there was a different Meyer. So people kind of get us mixed up. And uh, she was widowed at the age of 24. She had three children, but she found room. For you. For what? It was a bad time. I have an article that hold a Mm -hmm. Smith wrote about that, yeah. which is uh, pretty self-explanatory. And of course we knew Ida. Mm -hmm. Everybody loved Ida. Right. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, Celia, was, Celia was her name. And from now on, she'll be known as mother to me, mm -hmm. because she seemed like my mother. How old were I don't you remember old? my parents. I was two years old. Two. Yeah. Okay, back to childhood memories. Well, oh, incidentally, that was a very good home to come to. Um, the first thing I remember, I think I was about four years old, I had a little coaster wagon. It had a wooden box. It didn't have rubber tires. It had wooden wheels with a steel rim, just like the big wagons. The hubcap was missing from the left rear wheel, and there was a big nail in there to hold the wheel on. And I was going down the sidewalk pretty fast, and I hit that nail with the knuckle on my ankle, and that I can still feel it. But that's the first thing I remember in my life. Um, we usually went barefoot in the summer. We lived near the railroad track. We got a lot of tramps, and they usually got a handout. Sometimes they'd have to split a little wood before they'd get something to eat. And we also, I also remember what they called the pie freight. What's the pie freight? When she heard, when mother heard the whistle at 11 o'clock, she said, it's time to put the pie in the oven. So that got to be the pie freight. I remember riding on the train to Brainerd, and I had an uncle that lived uh, west of Brainerd ride to Brainerd and ride and then walk up to his farm. And Charlie Kraft run the depot in the store in Brainerd and we could get a sack of chocolate candy about that high and that big around for a nickel. Enough to make us sick several times. <laughs> I remember riding out to western Iowa on the train one time out to Rock Valley. Had an aunt that lived out there. So the store I told you about was Adam Bolin, and <laughs> usually went over there to get a ring of bologna and a loaf of bread. Got my overalls over there. We had a milkman in town. Didn't get the milk at the store. Hern Holzer was our milkman. The milk came in pint and quart bottles, glass bottles. And Larry Grimm, he was a classmate of Tom, your husband. He was a running boy. He delivered the, the bottles from the truck to the porches. That it was whole milk. It was not pasteurized and it wasn't uh, separated. And the next morning we could scrim, skim quite a bit of cream off the top and that's what mother used for cooking. And uh, I like to watch the trains. 
that time we had the canning factory and the sugar would come in, they'd get a car load of sugar during factory time and then they'd have to put the train on the side rail that went right down in front of the factory and they used big or long poles with a lever on them to move the cars somebody on top to put on the brakes there was a little incline there and then when they had it unloaded if they didn't need the empty car it stayed there and they reloaded it with cases of corn to be shipped out and a lot of the servicemen found Elgin corn in many of the foreign countries during World War II. I also remember watching the train. Uh, new cars came in and on the train. Sometimes I had quite a time getting them out. Livestock went out from the stockyards to Chicago. Uh, there were several trains every day, even passenger trains. In the later years it was just the dinky, that was just the one, one passenger train. There was no, no, we had cars then and not many people went by train anymore. First clothing, I usually wore knee pants. I suppose now they'd be called shorts, I mean we called them knee pants. And button shoes. Um, I don't know if boys would wear button shoes now. Maybe they would, they wear earrings. The first long pants I got, I bought, we got from Fred R. Berg. I got a suit down there. He ran the clothing store. We had a garden, had two gardens in town. And uh, had a little garden that I usually spaded. And I <coughs> took my little wagon, went over to Shorey Brothers. They had a farm just the other side of the railroad track and the stockyards. They had a manure pile there, and we'd, they'd let me take some manure for our garden. I'd haul it on my coaster wagon. I suppose uh, the hired man there was glad to get rid of a big load of manure once in a while so he wouldn't have to haul it. <laughs> Feels out of wagon spoke. <laughs> And I raised, we raised corn and peas, not corn, beans and peas and carrots mostly and tomatoes, cucumbers, cabbage, and we uh, mother canned a lot of stuff, so we always had quite a bit to eat. And I remember Billy Whiskers plowing the bigger garden. Who was Billy Whiskers? Billy Whiskers, I don't know who Billy Whiskers was, but that's what we called him. <laughs> and I think he came from up around Brainerd. He had a team of horses and a wagon and a, and a plow, and he'd come and plow gardens. And he used pretty foul language when managing his horses, and mother got after him about it. And when he came back the next day to finish, he called, his, called him sweetheart and honey and all that. They pulled, pulled the plow just as well as they did before. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I had notes here. We also had an apple tree in the front yard. Two Whitney's. Very good apples. I remember climbing up there and we'd just eat apples. But Probably. she made apple pickles. Apple pickles. Right. The Whitney's. Mm -hmm. And beet pickles. I was known as beets, please, in the family. She was a good seamstress and a good cook and she worked in the canning factory. During bean season, she snipped beans, and and in corn season, she uh, run a husker. We used to, I used to play with a hoop and wheel. What's a hoop and wheel? I don't know why it was called a hoop and wheel because the uh, the stick we used was a lath about thirty inches long with a cross piece at the bottom, and the wheel was the the hoop off of the hub of a wagon was about eight inches, just a metal rim, and we'd push that around for hours. We got so good we could push it down the railroad track, keep it on the rail. And uh, in the wintertime, we went sliding down on the Cooley Hill, and that's part of the property that uh, Oliver Larson owns now. And we'd also hook a bob 
what do you do when you hook a bob? Some farmer would come to town with a bobsled, maybe with a load of hogs, or come after some feed, and we'd run behind him and take the loose end of the rope of our sled and run it through where the runner was fastened to the bobsled and hang on to that and get on our sled and ride from one end of town to the other. And when we wanted to quit, all we had to do is let go of the loose end of the rope. We had a nice house in town. We always had electric lights, as far as I know, here in town. We did have a well and a pump in the backyard till we got city water, but we always had a cistern and a pressure pump in the basement, so we had running water and, and a bath in the, in the house, but we also had an outdoor toilet. I had chickens in a brooder house, I got, had eggs most of the time, we red Rhode Island reds, and uh, I hauled a lot of their feed from the canning factory. I could get uh, the stuff that came out of the cutter room was pretty near solid corn, it was the cleanings, and I'd haul that home in my little wagon and that would be the chicken feed during the canning season. They also got uh, scraps from the house, and I suppose Halden Guernsey would bring corn in from the farm, corn and oats. We got our first car was a Model T Ford, about a 1924. And I remember <coughs> Getting to go to Old Wine was a big treat. We'd go down there to go shopping, and we'd go to a restaurant and have a hot beef and gravy sandwich, and also go to the baker and get some some baked goods. Take the train? No, the no. Model T Ford. Louis drove. Okay. It was a gravel road all the way. In the summers, I stayed out on the farm with Halda and Guernsey. Then there I learned to milk cows by hand. I drove on the hay loader when I was about eight years old. And a lot of that ground was flooded by the river and brought in a lot of weed seeds. One year we got a lot of morning glories and that they would wrap around the corn and smother the corn. And that was before herbicides, so we had to pull that out of the cornfield, oh, unwrap it from the corn. We spent many days in the hot sun doing that. Not just me alone, but the whole family. I learned to cultivate there. My first cultivating job was for an old man. It was, that was about two or three generations apart there. He was too old to run both the horse, drive the horses and run the cultivator and I was too young to run the cultivator so Guernsey put a seat on the tongue I sat on there and drove and Frank handled the uh, handled the handles on the cultivator. That was pretty much well weekends I'd go back to Grandpa and Grandma's and try to keep up with Harold and Melbourne who were a little older and a little tougher and Monday I'd be sick I'd probably miss school because I overdid on Saturday and Sunday. Did you know there was a depression? I sure did, yeah. It didn't bother us too much. Uh, most of our food was homegrown. Homegrown and home canned. Home butchered chickens, eggs. We had bacon, eggs, and fried potatoes nearly every morning. I suppose that accounts for the high cholesterol. Uh, clothes was made out of feed sacks that came from the chicken feed that they bought. And it was um, bagged up in fancy cloth. Of course, there wasn't much traveling. If you went anywhere, it was walk or take the horses. Hogs sold for three dollars, corn sold for nine cents a bushel. I 
give you a sense of not fun. Well, thank you. I'm glad Tom mentioned you that you go back to your childhood. Uh, Vernon, I wanted to ask you, when did you get uh, fluent English? Um, gradually. Was, gradually, right? Yeah, it, it was that, and it was in uh, about I suppose about the second, third grade. Mm -hmm. Elmer mentioned some uh, Swiss cookings and customs. Do you have any in Norwegian? Norwegian. <laughs> They're well known for their specialties. They have, um, and of course, being a, or coming from a cold country like that, they were not used to vegetables and that type of thing. They had, they did have, um, like my dad liked peas, but that was about the only vegetable he'd eat. And uh, consequently, I don't care too much for <laughs> vegetables either. And, but we had pies and cake and cookies and, and everything like that every single day. And, um, at, in the holiday time, of course, and we would have the lefse and the flatbread, and um, sandbuckles, uh, crumb cakes, all this really good, good things. And some people really like Ludafisk. I would not walk across the room for it. <laughs> Helmer says he's never tried it. No, I never liked it. And they, let's see, and of course they're, they're, with the Ludafisk they always had the roomy groat. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's another thing I never cared for. It was too rich. No. Um, I Elmer, don't know what uh, Elmer mentioned the factory. Did you ever work in the fa corn factory? No. My mother did, um, I think one one year that she helped out. She, I don't know why she tried it because she had been very, very sick and over a period of many years. Um, and she was, uh, she was in Rochester, first in the hospital and then in a boarding house for six months. She never came home in those six months oh. time. And so we would get to go to see her once in a while. And that was always a big deal. Because we were young enough to to enjoy seeing those geese up there, and, and then we would always have a chance to choose something to take home as a remembrance. And the last thing that I remember that Artis and I chose was a, a necklace or a it was a chain with a little um, like a stone and a rose flower was carved out of that. Mine was blue and Artis's was pink. So I always knew which one was ours. How much time you got left? <clears throat> oh, you got a lot of time yet. Um, can I tell you the difference in farming? Yes, but I want to know what the dinky is. My dad ran into it one time <laughs> in West Union, but I never did know why that train was called the dinky. I suppose because it was small. And we had only one car. As far as train was concern, concerned. It was uh, just one car. It had the engine and the passenger compartment all in one. It was about the size of one railroad car, passenger car. Mm -hmm. It was just mostly mm -hmm. passenger it then. Had, mm -hmm. Yeah, just strictly passenger mm -hmm. and maybe a little mail. I see. I rode on that. Did you? Where to did Decora. To Decora. To Decora. To Decora. A lot of passengers rode on the train, didn't mm -hmm. they? Uh, it was a, that's why Old Wine was a shopping center at that yep. time. Mm 
because it was easy to get there and back in one day. And a lot of the stuff came in on the train. We had a dray that delivered the stuff to the different stores. In fact, the roof on our farm, on the house on our farm, came in on the train and came through Les Lane and Hardware Store. It's uh, metal shingles. And we still have a box up in the attic with a shingle or two. Well, and that was built when? 19 what? 1914. 1914, and still the same roof. It's been painted several times. Tea and milk here. My father ordered a wagon tongue one time from Montgomery Ward in the <laughs> Um, rural route. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stuck out of the car. Mailman delivered? Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you a little about the difference or how farming was when I first started working on the farm. There was no electricity. We had gas engines and a pump, pump jack or a windmill to pump the water and it was pumped into a reservoir usually. And then from the reservoir, it went to the stock tank. The stock tank had a valve and a float that would shut it off when it was full. There were no tractors. We had horsepower only. The plow I started with was called a sulky plow. That plowed one sixteen-inch furrow. It had a seat on it, so I didn't have to walk. It took three horses to pull it. We had a disc, which was a single disc. It stopped. Mm -hmm. That's one. It doesn't matter. Oh, that still goes? Okay. Just go on. I'll keep on. The disc was about seven feet wide and took three or four horses to pull that. We had a three-section drag, and that was three horses. There was a cedar, and that was pulled by two horses. That was for seeding oats and barley, things like that. And there was a two-row corn planter pulled by two horses. And you also had the wire check so you could check, call check the corn so you could cultivate in both directions. We had a walk, walking cultivator pulled by two horses. You walked behind that as you cultivated the corn. And then we had a riding cultivator the second time. Second, third, and fourth time through we got to use the rider. There was a grain binder, some were six foot, some were seven foot, some were eight foot. Cut the grain and tied it into bundles. And then we had to shock, put the bundles into shocks. Let them set for oh, a week or two before thrashing started. And thrashing, none of the farmers, not uh, individual farmers, had a thrashing machine. It was usually a a group of farmers or Turkelson brothers owned a thrashing machine and the first thrashing I remember was with their thrashing machine and a steam engine and they used wood mostly old fence posts to heat the water on the steam engine to run the thrashing machine that was always a neighborhood or several farmers together doing thrashing, probably seven or eight farmers in a group. Then there was a grain binder, that or corn binder, one row, and that uh, cut the corn and tied it in bundles. And uh, if you had a silo, then you hauled it in right after it was cut and run it through a silo cutter and into the silo. And the first silo I remember filling was a uh, powered silo cutter was powered by a farm horse tractor that Albert Bietekofer, Albert Schuppach owned. If you cut corn for shredding, then we had to shock it and tie the shocks. And that was left until in the fall. And that, you know, that again was like thrashing you had group of farmers together. Somebody owned a corn shredder and something to power it. And farmers got together and hauled the bundles in and run them through the shredder. And quite a few people lost their fingers in the corn shredder, like they did in the first corn pickers. 
we didn't have big tractors. We had uh, wagons with hay racks and uh, wood rack. The wood rack was used for hauling in the wood to saw up later for firewood, or it was used for hauling the bundles to the to the silo cutter. A wood rack was just a flat flat bed with about 36 inches wide and it had a, a wooden stake on each corner. And the, the higher you made it, the bigger you had to make your load so you didn't didn't want to make your stakes too high or it looked like you were lazy. Had a wagon box or two with bang boards. The corn was husked by hand and the bang boards were used to to throw the web, to throw the corn against. The horses went down the road by themselves. Once in a while they'd run away. You'd have to run after them. I remember one time I had the manure spreader. Outside of the chicken house, I was cleaning the chicken house. And instead of putting the lines up on the nail on the chicken house, I wrapped them around the handle that puts the spreader in gear something scared the horses and they took off. It was in the spring and it was muddy. They ran up through the cornfield and I was running after, behind them. <laughs> but I finally caught them and climbed up over the back and it kind of makes you shudder when you think of what would have happened if that thing would have went in gear. But it didn't and I got them stopped. I don't think I ever told anybody about it afterward. But I always hung, put the lines on the nail after that. Uh, so we did have a manure spreader and a couple wagons, several scoop shovels, three time forks for moving hay, and four, five, and six time forks for handling manure. There were no bar clean, barn cleaners, there was a gutter. We cleaned that out with a wheelbarrow, shovels, and forks. That was cleaned out every day. And uh, that was the tools, what we worked with. What time frame, what years are we talking about? That was 1932 when I started working on the farm. Where were you living? Right off south of town here with Mark and Louise. You were Wayne. married then? No. Not yet. I was still in high school. Oh, yes. I had two years of high school yet, too. Well, that's quite a story. You're so thorough with it. Really descriptive. Thank you. Where did uh, you say about Guernsey and Holden? Is that up east town? Holden and Guernsey live down where Mike Klein lives. It's uh, oh, the Chris Meyer place, it's called. May I ask you what they did with They shredded, but what did they do with that? Was it feed or bedding? The, it was feed. And they ate everything but the coarser stalks, and then that was thrown over for bedding. Cattle. Right. Did they have dairy? Were there dairy cattle? Beef cattle, Beef mostly. Cattle. And the corn, corn came out as ear ear corn, and that was scooped into the corn grain bins, corn cribs rather. And that was better corn than the corn that's automatically dried now. Verna, you did live in your home place, right? Mm -hmm. When did you go there? Move there. We uh, we lived. We moved there in 1940. 1940. Mm -hmm. From Decora. And when were you married? 1950. 50. Uh, your parents were living there then, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that were they? Some of them. Your parents immigrated? Your grandparents? Grandparents. Uh, just one grandparent. And all the others were great-grandparents. The, uh, the Groth family immigrated here in 1849 through 1852. And then the entire family was here. Um, the Kirkeberg and Halverstons that was uh, between 1850, between 1850 and uh, 
1876 that they came. So there was quite a spread there. Were the two houses down there? At, on our farm? Yes. Yes. They're the old house and, and the new house after 1914. There was one thing that um, I was told about, and that was my grandmother, no, my great-grandmother, lived in the old house, and she was not uh, used to any modern equipment of any kind. And so when the uh, new house with the home plant, electric plant, was installed, they put a switch in the main house for turning on the light at her house. So then in the morning, at the time that she would be getting up, they would turn on the switch in the house, in the new house, and she would have light in her house. And that just constantly amazed her, that she didn't do a thing. She would just, all of a sudden, that light came on. And then in the evening, after she was ready in bed, the light would go off. And everybody that came, she would tell that story to because she just could not figure out how that light went on and off. So did she speak English? No. 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 My did grandmother didn't either. Did you learn the language then? Yes, that's when we, um, well, I grew up. You grew up with it? With Norwegian speaking, yeah. My grandmother wouldn't let us, she wouldn't answer us if we spoke English. So therefore, we, that's why we didn't know how to speak uh, English when we were supposed to be going to school. You were living there. Did you do any farming there, Elmer? Not then, later years you did, yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, you had children? Two boys. Two boys. Their names? The older was David, and the younger one is James. David um, David died when he was 24. He had cancer. And uh, James is, lives outside of town here. And he's our, he, he does everything for us that we need to have help with. And he's the one that's taking care of the farm now. We don't. We, we thought we could live on the farm. They thought otherwise. <laughs> and I guess they were right. We didn't uh, realize how sick we were. And I had no idea that I was sick. None at all. And I thought I could easily take care of Elmer. And uh, we, uh, after he had had his surgery. But the kids um, got this place lined up for us. It was the only house available in town that particular time. And uh, they, they literally picked us up and moved us because they, uh, they brought all the furniture and, and all the dishes and everything like that in, put everything in place. And when everything was ready here in the house, then they came out and they said, now it's your turn. And so we had to put our coats on and come. That night, a storm was, was uh, forecast. It really didn't get as bad as what we were expecting, but nevertheless, it would have been impossible for me to take care of Elmer. And uh, so, and it would have been questionable whether James could have gotten out there. What time, what year was that? Um, 1994. Right. It was a good move. Yes. You look so good now. It took two years to convince me though. Well, we know the story. <laughs> Our kids moved us too. Are you convinced yet? It yeah. was, yeah. it was an Easter Sunday mm -hmm. and I, we were practically moved in. We'd been working in the house, 
and they wanted to move us. And I said, but leave my bed alone out, bedroom alone out there. I don't want my clothes one place and me another. Well, before the day was over, everything was moved, including the clothes. Mm -hmm. So we spent that Easter Sunday in town. Oh, that's what they did for us. And uh, it was uh, James and Cheryl and David and Jennifer and Jamie that did all the work, wasn't it? It wasn't long after that till she was about ready for the wheelchair. And then we, James said, you better get a second opinion on your back problems. So we went to La Crosse and she saw a neurologist and when she walked in into his office, she said, I think you've got Parkinson's. And, and the next time up, he said, that's right, and he put her in medication. She's 100% better now than she was. Yeah. I had to, help, had to help her into bed, in and out of bed. And yeah, I couldn't get up. You this far. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't do a thing. I couldn't uh, even dress myself. And the shoes was a, a challenge that I couldn't meet at all. And for one reason, my, my feet were so small that uh, you couldn't get a shoe on. We had to go to, a, to the store and get a shoe size that's two sizes too big for me now. Well, what was it? You lost 30 pounds of fluid? For the, yeah. And after she and got I, off a certain medication. I've lost more than that, so. Well, that was fluid, though. Mm -hmm. Well, we're glad you're here, and we're glad you're our neighbors. And isn't it surprising how smart our kids get <laughs> as they get older and how stubborn <laughs> we get? <laughs> how true. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add? to this interview? I don't know. Did you well, tell anything? Well, let's see. I made notes. I can quickly look. I'm getting old. I have to have notes. What's your name? You ought to be up here on the table and be introduced. Don't you think our youngest one She's is well behaved? Yeah. This is Penny. She's... Yeah, you have to see Penny's in there. She's seven years old. Well, there was something on electricity there. Oh, yes. Do you want anything uh, on that? Well, the REA wanted us to question it if you had anything to contribute about the coming of the electricity because REA, if the homes that didn't have it, REA played, REC today, played mm -hmm. an important part in the development of this country. Well, at that time I was working for Mark Louise down on the farm where my client is now and we didn't have electricity there. We had electricity on our farm that was uh, put in when, when the house was built, and it was a 12-volt um, what, what generator. Yeah. And uh, so we had lights, and we had, you know, different uh, conveniences, but it was nothing in comparison to the REC or the REA at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lights were so much brighter. We could see everything in the room, every, even everything in, in the corners, which was not possible before. No. And uh, and of course we could have we could have an electric iron. That I think was the thing that we enjoyed the most because we didn't have to have that wood stove running to heat the flat irons for ironing clothes. And. Um, we we also then could get hydrants in in different places so we didn't have to carry the water and we had dairy cattle and in the winter time as it was a real cold day my dad never let those cows out of the barn and so we would have to carry the water to the 31 cows <laughs> and, that, and so that was really nice and we had a they had drinking cups for the cow and it was 
well, it was just a great big change when those, when the lights came through. Do you remember, Elmer, did you, how did you promote getting these lights, lines through there? You know, my dad had to sell memberships, but yeah. I don't remember much about it. Uh. Yeah, you had to have a membership, and then you had, I think you had to pay part of the line. I don't know how far that went, but, uh, and then the REC would pay the, or the REA would pay the rest of it. If they had enough sign up to take it, <coughs> then it would go through there. Yeah. And I know he had to collect five dollars, and five dollars was pretty hard to get in those days. Mm -hmm. well, you had to pay for part of your line going into your place from the... Uh, interstate. Oh, that's the interstate up there? No. Oh. I don't think we had to pay for REC, did we? Oh, Other than the membership? If you were over so far away, you had to. Oh, yeah. you did. The last yeah. piece was just a little over a thousand feet, and they had to get mm -hmm. something. Because um, that's <coughs> why the line goes straight up over the hill. Mm -hmm. It was the shortest route. Well, now, we didn't own the farm I grew up on, but maybe, maybe the landlord paid something. Mm -hmm. no, you can't, you'd have to pay anything. You can't but imagine he would. He didn't pay anything that else. That <laughs> well, that's. That was something. I know what that was like too to have have a landlord. We had, of course, down down around here we had uh, the landlords too. But I don't remember them. But I remember the one that we had up by Decora, and that was uh, that was a, a person that the money never went uh, far enough. She was always broke. So, and and we were paying the highest rent in the neighborhoods. <laughs> well, if this is all that we have to contribute, I thank you for this, and we hope it's um, of some use to someone sometime. We hope Tom got it on. We got Tom there. Well, I hope come so. over to our place. We'll watch it then. They probably have this. Yeah, yeah, we do. Do we? Mm -hmm. We'll put it in. You done? Yep.